I, I don't even know. We'll have the details when we do the numbers. You pay attention with so much at stake. Seas are rising and chronic flooding will be the new normal. You navigate, you listen, you keep an ear out. You pay attention and so do we. We tell the stories of our time every day. In the 26th day of testimony and on the 139th witness, Shahar Zarnayev wept. We unearth what would otherwise stay hidden. There's just a lot of hate in this world. And that day, for that hour, we were humans. Across the street. The Red Sox have won the World Series. And around the globe. It's here and now. This is Modern Love. This is WBUR is All Things Considered. This is only a game. This is On Point. This is Radio Boston. On air, online, on demand, and on stage in the heart of Boston. I'm Jack Lepiars. Welcome to WBUR City Space. Always looking forward, paying attention, and knowing that your story is one of our stories. Good morning. I'm Bob Epps. I'm Lisa Mullins. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. I'm Jeremy Hobson. This is 90.9 WBUR, Boston. Take the four seat. Did you bring me takeout? I brought you a present. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. I'm Cheryl Julian. Uh, welcome to WBUR City Space. It's a beautiful space for those of you who haven't been here uh, and not seen it before. Uh, if you're uh, tweeting or on Instagram, um, please use at WBUR City Space. Um, you'll see a picture of me and Anna in the green room, if you, uh, if you search for it. And if you want to find out what's going on in this stage um, all year, it's wbur.org slash newsletters. Um, we take questions from the audience at night on, um, on a polling app uh, called Slido, but there's nothing you need to download. You just go open your browser and go to uh, slido.com. Uh, I have to put on my glasses for this. Um, the code is CC909. I think it might be up there. Um, and you submit questions, and then you can vote on the ones that you want to encourage me to ask. Um, and uh, we can't uh, get to all of them, unfortunately. But maybe I'll have um, asked all of them by the time it's, um, it gets to Slido. Uh, I am um, a f longtime food editor of the Boston Globe, and uh, I still write uh, for the Globe <clears throat> and edit a little bit. And uh, I teach a uh, food media course in the uh, Master's in Gastronomy program at Boston University. Um, my students are here, and I'd like to welcome them. Um, someday, I imagine, one of them will be up here asking the questions, and I'll be the proud mama in the audience. Um, my guest, Anna Sortan, welcome. Sortun, Sortun. Thank you. Uh, has three restaurants in the Boston area. Oleana, her first, was opened in 2001 in Cambridge, and then came Sofra Bakery, which is a small cafe on the Cambridge Watertown Belmont line, and then Sarma in Somerville. Uh, she's won a James Beard Award for uh, Best Chef of um, Northeast, and she's written two books, one called Spice and one called So For Me's. I think So For Me's is for sale in the lobby yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Um, and uh, on my Instagram page, it came up that I interviewed you today, oh. exactly in your house, when So For Me's came out. Wow. I thought that was, <laughs> I thought that was great, great um, irony. Uh, so, describe if if I were if, if you were to write your own entry in a guidebook, a restaurant guidebook of Boston. Um, describe in a sentence or two what what your restaurants are like, what your cooking is like. Um, well, I think when I opened Oleana 18, 19 years ago, uh, I was really uh, our mission at that point was really to expand people's. Um, perception of what Mediterranean food was. I mean, for so long we were focused on the food of Spain, the food of the south of France or Italy. And um, 
I was really uh, determined to sort of broaden that perception of what Mediterranean food was. With a, uh, I wanted to bring Middle Eastern food into the mainstream, particular with a particular focus on Turkey. And um, I was really inspired, um, and I mean, it was almost like a an obsession to really understand the role of spice and vegetables in Mediterranean cooking. So, beginning with Oleana, which I know is your given name. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so your name is Oleana Sartoon. Right. Okay. <clears throat> wonderful. Too bad you didn't become a, a uh, newspaper, a journalist, because it'd be a wonderful byline on the front page of a newspaper <laughs> with breaking news. Uh, what, uh, what, are, what are the other names from Sofra and Sarma? Um, so yeah, by the way, I never imagined, I, I changed, my parents called me Anna because I used to get teased growing up in Seattle, um, having the name Oleana because there's a song, I don't know if anybody knows it. Exactly. <laughs> For all the Scandinavians, so how does this Norwegian girl from Seattle start cooking Turkish food? It's very complicated, but Oleana is the name of a, a, the paradise or a utopia, and the song is about um, a utopia in, um, Norway, I believe, um, which obviously f uh, failed, but it's a happy song, in other words. <laughs> but so everybody else wanted to call, um, everybody else thought it was appropriate for the, the name of the restaurant. Sofra is uh, the name of, Sofra is a, a complicated meaning, but when you say it in Turkey, everyone smiles. And to a lot of people, it means something different. It's definitely a, t a hospitality term, but um, sort of uh, to boil it down, it means what you prepare for the table. So whether it's the food, the plates, the candles, um, the napkins, the flowers, whatever you put on the table um, is your sofra. Um, and so if you came to my house on a Sunday night and had dinner, my sofra might be different than if you came to my house um, in the morning for breakfast or something. So everyone, everyone's sofra is very personal uh, for who you're preparing the meal for. Um, and then Sarma is um, the name of a... Uh, a dolma or something that's wrapped or rolled. And they're usually very small bundles of something that's been wrapped or rolled. And um, in some sense, it's a slang word for embrace or hug. And Sofra Mies, the name of your and book? And Sofra Mies just is my Sofra, our Sofra, sorry. Not, not my, but our Sofra. Okay. Meaning it's really about the story of um, my incredible business partner, Mora, and her, her pastry talents and how we met. And, Mora and Kilpatrick. Mora Kilpatrick, yeah, mm -hmm. who's everything pastry, basically, on our, on our team. Mm -hmm. So name some of the dishes that convinced you that this was the region you decided to concentrate on. Um, like when you first the, fell in love with the cooking. I don't even know what they were called, to be honest, but I mean, I think what happened was I was invited... Um, I was cooking at a place in Harvard Square called Casablanca. The owner was um, Syrian, and he was having dinner one night with a woman from Turkey. And um, for those of, if for anyone that knows Sorry Abul Jabain from okay. Casablanca, he was no stranger to a cocktail, right? Sorry, are you here? <laughs> 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 Anyhow, he had a few drinks, and um, this woman, <laughs> this woman convinced him that he should send his his chef to Turkey to learn how to. Uh, cook Turkish food. And, um, and he thought that was a great idea. So after dinner, she came up and introduced herself. And her name was Ifer. And she said, uh, your boss just said you can come to Turkey and, and study with me. And I thought, Turkey? Wow. I thought of like genies and flying carpets. I had no idea. So what, it was really your just... your real first question, where's that? <laughs> well, at first I thought, I think I know where that is. And I, I wasn't quite sure. I, what I was really focused on was, what kind of food is that? What does that mean? Um, so I think the very first time I, I, well, when I landed, I arrived at Eifer's house. And her friends, she had um, invited 30 of her friends to prepare a potluck for me. And it was in a park. And they each brought a dish that was really special to them, something that, that they, they practiced, that they thought represented um, their, their region. Mm -hmm. So there was a, I tasted 30 different dishes and I, I couldn't even, I had no idea what anything was. I just knew that it was incredibly interesting. It was incredibly rich. There were flavors I'd never tasted before and I couldn't even sit down. I was so excited. I just had so many questions. And then I realized that I had just eaten, I just tasted 30 different things at lunchtime. 
And I thought, oh my God, I feel great. This is amazing. What kind of food is this that you can uh, really enjoy and taste everything and not feel terrible at the end? And then... <laughs> I so mean, then you you uh, wrote in Spices about the woman who came to read everyone's coffee leaves. Right, that was Aisha. Coffee grants. Okay, so explain. Someone, a Turkish woman, read my coffee grants. I was really, really fascinated. So explain uh, how that how that works. Because in you know, I I think it's interpretive. I'm, I'm people that read them probably would say otherwise, but I think it's really about social bonding mm -hmm. and. Um, a little bit of storytelling, um, and it's a, it's actually a really beautiful sort of caring process, I think. Mm -hmm. And there are different cues. So explain how what happens with your coffee cup. Yeah, so you drink a Turkish coffee is ground really fine. The the coffee is ground really fine, like powdered sugar, and then it's brought to a gentle boil three times, so that as it's um, kind of rising, it forms this uh, crema on top, like the Italian espresso. Um, and then it's poured into a cup and the grounds settle to the bottom. And then you drink the coffee to the, just to the grounds. Um, and then you're left with, you know, really kind of mud, basically. And you turn it upside sludge. down, sludge, mm -hmm. on your saucer. And then you let it sit and you're supposed to sort of hold it and, um, I don't know, hope, I guess, that your, your reading is going to be positive. And then um, it creates shapes in the, in the mm -hmm. uh, cup as well as on the saucer, too. And then the storytelling um, starts from reading the shapes. Right. So you you write that if you if it's polka dots, you're spending too much money, <laughs> yeah. and if it's a shape of a woman's purse, there's money in your future. Exactly. I and really snakes like that. And mountains and all sorts of things. Yeah. And yeah. did anything come true? Um, I think I've had my grounds uh, read many times, um, and I must say. Well, there's little hints of, I think mm -hmm. there was um, a struggle and an uphill sort of battle, but, um, and lots of men, that didn't work out so well, but. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. You'd... Just the right one. Yeah, the right one, <laughs> right, exactly. So um, let's talk about the vast array of flatbreads in this, in this region. Um, they were, um, they were either made at home or and taken to the bakery to be baked or made um, at the bakery. Um, uh, when I was um, in a couple cities in the Middle East, I saw long, long lines outside the bakeries at very late at night. I think they were buying them for breakfast, and the bread was coming up from the basement on canvas conveyor belts, R really sort of a makeshift situation. Um, are they baked? These breads baked several times a day, and 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 what are what are some of your favorites? Well, I think so. The flatbreads in Turkey. So bread is a a, a really different perception in, in Turkish cooking. I can't necessarily speak for Israel and um, Jordan and Syria and Lebanon, but um, bread is a bread is something that's meant to be sort of marinated. Um, it's not often that you sit down. You do have some sort of poof bread that you're eating with meze, but it's not the same as like the pita with hummus um, that we all know of. But bread is a vehicle to be marinated. So um, when they make kebabs, they take the flatbread and they actually put it on top of the grilling meat so that the flavors of the meat are absorbed by bread. And then once the kebabs are cooked, they rest it on the bread and then they sort of roll it around the bread so that the whole bread then is um, marinated or bathed or soaked or brushed with the meat juices and the spices that are on the meat. And then the bread is eaten. Um, so it's used, it's, it's mostly used for a purpose, but there's lots of um, different kinds, mostly uh, lavash type um, or what they call yufka, which is an unleavened bread. But then there's also uh, one of my favorites, which is, it sounds terrible. Sorry about the mic there. Mm -hmm. Sounds terrible, but it's called fingernail bread, and it's just like um, focaccia because you scratch it with your fingernails when you're making it. So you know how focaccia has the dimples in it, but in Turkey they make patterns with their fingernails all the way around the the bread, so that it's um, it's uh, it's a very beautiful visual mosaic on the bread. Mm -hmm. uh, you trained at Lavrin Cooking School in Paris. Um, uh, founded by Ann Willen, and uh, I thought it was a wonderful place. 
Um, I, I, I ran it for a while. So. Did you really? Full disclosure, yes. Um, probably before you got there. Before? Yeah. yeah. I didn't um, know that. And uh, and were you were you already um, working in kitchens when you went, or was that your first um, culinary endeavor? I started when I was fourteen washing dishes, and uh, the same age my my daughter's about to be fourteen. I'm thinking, oh my God, I was Where's already she in the dishes? restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, yeah, mm -hmm. she, she'll probably be out picking carrots before she's washing dishes. But um, she uh, yeah, anyhow, I was fourteen, and uh, I knew I was washing dishes for about nine months and I kept watching you know washing and like watching what was going on in the kitchen and and the owners recognized that and it was a small family run restaurant in a neighborhood in Seattle and it was uh, it was actually New Mexican food the owners were from Albuquerque um, and so I they saw my interest and they actually ended up sending me to cooking school after school and um, so I started at a really young age and then I was determined I would go to go to France um, to La Varenne to learn how to cook. Mm -hmm. La Varenne was a bilingual cooking school in Paris that um, eventually moved to Burgundy and then, and then closed. It had a year-long uh, chef's training program. Mm -hmm. Lots of um, people in the U.S. at the top of the kitchen so it went there. Um, you cooked with uh, Monsef Medeb for several years, um, and he was born in Tunisia, and he graduated from Harvard and became a restaurateur, mm -hmm. um, first at Les Paliers. Um, he passed away uh, recently. Uh, tell, tell me about your history with Monsef. Um, well, Monsef, um, I was 25. I just moved to Boston, and he uh, actually, uh, thanks for the pizza, Anthony, wherever you are. This goes back to Anthony and Dee Dee, who, um, thank you, that was awesome. <laughs> so sweet. We had pizza in the green room. Um, <laughs> Oto. The owner of Oto Pizza in the house. Um, I, anyhow, he, I was working at a, he basically wanted to open a restaurant in Concord. Mm -hmm. I had just moved here. Um, I was looking for, it was my first chef's job. Um, and he and I met um, and really hit it off. I think what I remember most about Monsef, and um, and as you said, he just he just passed away, so there's a lot of memories that are coming back. But I remember opening Igo Bistro, and I was and I the restaurant in the, in the Concord work. train station. Yeah, in the mm -hmm. Concord where uh, 80 Thoreau is now. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of work um, as opening a new restaurant is. So it was maybe 10:30 or 11 at night, and um, and that's kind of late for. The suburbs, actually, it's um, <laughs> uh, no offense. I live in the suburb in the suburbs, but uh, anyhow, it was. I was sit I was done with work. I hadn't eaten really like a normal meal, and I was so hungry. And I was talking to Monsef on the phone, and he was, uh, you know, of course, trying to get me to think about the menu and what we're going to do tomorrow and this and that, whatever. And I was so hungry um, that I just said, "Look, I got to call you back. I've got to make something to eat." And then he started. I was thinking more like egg sandwich or something, and he started <laughs> describing an orange, um, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna sit through this, I'm just gonna listen to this, mm -hmm. but he described an orange from the moment you peel the orange and the oil's just kind of hitting you in the face and kind of squirting, and then you could all of a sudden smell the, all of the oils in the orange, and then if it's a good orange, it starts to drip down your arms, and then as you pull apart the segments, and I'm thinking, I think I know, what an orange tastes like in my head. And I thought this is a, I mean, this is something that I think after time, somebody like Monsef, he could taste in his head and mm -hmm. he could just describe these flavors. And that's really what I, I took from him and his sort of aspiration, uh, the aspiration to sort of memorize um, food and, um, and be able to, to go through it in my head. And he was amazing at doing that. He was incredibly talented, but he also, did um, help me sort of with some of the North African flavors that um, I've fallen in love with, and of course, all those spices. And did you get off the phone and have an orange or an egg salad? I didn't have an orange. I <laughs> definitely would have had an orange if I had an orange, but um, yeah, I think it was probably the scrambled egg or something like that. <laughs> uh, what was the nightly dinner table like in your house in Seattle? Um, my dad went through like a wheat germ macaroni and cheese <laughs> phase, which was terrible. Um, <laughs> my mom was a great 
my mom was an unbelievable uh, baker and um, she was a really simple cook. And I think really what I've learned and taken from my mother is that um, she was a stickler for ingredients. And I've always kind of wondered, my dad used to always say to me, why do you have to go to cooking school in France? Why can't you just go to cooking school here? And I never used to be able to answer that question because of course you can learn bechamel, croissants, um, everything, you can learn it all here. But what we couldn't, what I couldn't learn here was the absolute respect for ingredients and seasonal ingredients. It just wasn't happening at the time um, where I was. And, um, and it was also this little piece of my, my mother who would never touch margarine. And during those days, everybody was, nobody was eating butter. It was all margarine. Um, and she would only, uh, she grew up on a farm and she knew what a really good peach was. And so she taught me the difference between a, an unbelievable peach or a fresh picked strawberry during strawberry season. Um, and so I really think uh, it wasn't about fancy stuff. It was mostly about sort of pure mm -hmm. ingredient. Quality. And going out of her way to get those. And if someone um, uh, who was your age when you went to Laverin uh, asked you if they should go to cooking school here or abroad, uh -huh. or if they should go to cooking school at all, what would you say? I think I, I would say... Um, I think school is always great. It's never a waste of time. Um, but I also think um, the experience is the most important thing. And I might recommend working on a farm and then working in a restaurant a little bit. Um, and I think only I only say that because I, I really, it, it's split my mind open how interesting it is to grow and raise food um, and how much more rich uh, the cooking experience becomes when you know more about it. Uh, I've been to Turkey a couple of times, and I noticed um, that whether I was at a white tablecloth restaurant or a roadside place, uh, the food, I thought, was essentially the same. There were, it was the same uh, repertoire, similar ingredients. Uh, there, there was little innovation or deviation, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what the level of restaurant was from, from the traditional recipes. Um, sometimes, in fact, I thought the roadside places were better because there was a mama in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, you've been there many, many, many times and in people's homes as well. Did we just not go to the right restaurants or... Is there, is there a wide variation and it just doesn't show up on menus? Um, po possibly. I think, um, I mean, I, I, like I just, yeah, I, I feel like I could go to France tomorrow and um, probably have a similar experience maybe. I mean, okay. even in the south of France. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I do, Turkey's huge, enormous, um, and it's very regional just like um, other European countries. So if you're in the Black Sea, there's... Um, a huge difference between the food in the south. The southeast mm -hmm. is really where the food is, um, like the mecca of gastronomy is in the southeast um, near the Syrian border. And right. then you get into the the peppers and the pistachios and um, some of the pomegranate molasses and more of the spices. Um, and then in uh, on the western side, it's all Greek. So mm -hmm. it's like it's, uh, well, I shouldn't say that because the Turks would not like that, but you know what I mean? It's all, it's Turkish, but it's more Greek. And uh, so it's, it's the Mediterranean side of things. And then, um, and then you get even, you get closer to Middle Eastern food when you get uh, to the Northeast. Um, and then the center of Turkey is so fascinating where they use, um, where they have cows and they have butter, um, and then you start seeing uh, where East meets West. And then Istanbul has its own, its own cuisine as well. And then there's the Ottoman cuisine. So there's a lot of different um, areas and regions. And there's a beautiful show on uh, Netflix called uh, The Chef's Table, where um, Chef Musa, uh, who's one of my mentors, has a, an episode. And it really uh, talks about like the Oh, the he's the one who just wrote the big cookbook. He did, mm -hmm. yeah. It's more of a, it's kind of an anthropological dive into the, right. um, the preservation of Turkish food. Right, of, of, um, the, um, of the home cooking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I feel like in the, you know, you can get sort of in the genre of going to meze restaurants, and the meze restaurants might look all similar, especially in the same town. 
um, or say a kebab house where, or even a fish restaurant, there's certain genres, but then um, I think in the rural parts, the more, the more complicated mm -hmm. uh, cooking happens in right. the home. The, what I call the cooking of the mamas. Yeah, exactly. Um, s there are certain dishes that are prepared um, the same way across a vast region that goes from Morocco to the Caucasus. And Americans tend to lump this food together as Middle Eastern. Um, and, it, and it's dishes like um, all kinds of eggplant and a tomato pepper paste um, uh, for dipping bread into, um, meat on skewers, flatbreads. Uh, and it's really Arabic and Jewish and Berber and Egyptian and Palestinian and Anatolian. Um, uh, don't you think that we should be talking about them as distinct cuisines rather than just uh, uh, this, you know, giant Middle Eastern or Southern Mediterranean or Eastern Mediterranean category? Yeah, but I think I'm just so glad we're talking about them. That's what. <laughs> uh -huh. Of course. I think that's how it all starts. But I think. Um, yeah, and I think uh, you know, for a long time, Turkey was a really hot place to go, and then you know. Um, a lot of things happen. I think it's just kind of scary in general to travel to big uh, big cities, especially in mm -hmm. uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. I think um, it's sort of hot and cold, but I know that um, the diet and the, I mean, it suits us. It's the Mediterranean diet. It's it's what we we want to eat. It's, it's super healthy and um, promotes lots of vegetables and delicious olive oil. And um, yeah, I think it's, I think there, there's a lot of differentiation. Sometimes I have to, uh, you know, sometimes in my own head, I'm, I'm mixing Lebanese with Turkish and I think, oh God, what am I doing? But then, you know, it's, I think what we really love, all of us, all of the chefs, um, and I, I really have to say that there's an incredible, incredible bunch of talents, uh, that I can't take credit for, but my partners, uh, Cassie and Mora. Cassie's the chef at Sarma. Mora is our pastry chef. I mean, we're doing Middle Eastern versions of um, nachos, and um, so sometimes, you know, even for kids' cooking classes and stuff, I'll do a fate and I'll just call it nachos or something because it's. So in other words, there's a. We like to understand the rules and really respect the traditions. But then with all three of us, all three of us have the need to be creative. Like it's just part of who we are. And so I think um, I think drawing from, I think there are common threads as you talked about, like it, there, there's spice threads, there's ingredient threads, there's um, hummus threads, bread threads, kebab threads, kufta, barek threads. Um, but and they're all like, no, 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 this is Greek, not Turkish. No, this is Turkish, not Greek. This is actually Armenian. Sorry, it's Armenian. Then it's uh, Syrian, not, you know, and it's just, it's this whole debate. But there are common threads. It does get political. It does get a little um, uh, heated and interesting. But um, I really think that what, what's cool is that um, we're taking, at our places, because of just the need to be creative, we're taking the politics away. And it's just... Um, oh, and we're just basically representing some flavors as being um, another part of the Mediterranean. Okay, so tell me if I overreacted in this, the following situation. Uh, <laughs> one of my writers sent me a list of recipes she wanted to do, and she described a pork dish made with za'atar. Mm -hmm. So za'atar, as you know, is a mixture of dry thyme and sesame seeds and other spices. And it's prepared in regions where pigs don't exist and where parts of the population won't eat pork for religious reasons. So I had a little fit. Um, and what I'm wondering is, in today's world, can you put ingredients together that would never be combined in their country of origin and sleep at night? <laughs> I I would have to um, like I, I would have to I agree I respect um, your thoughts around that and I think um, I'm I would have gone oof you know something like that but then again I think about I sit there and I think and I think 
What about all the churches and the mosques living together in Beirut? And what about um, the Greeks uh, using za'atar and eating pork? And then, so somewhere, someplace in the Middle East, somebody's eating za'atar with pork. Somebody. And it, maybe it's breaking the rules and they're going to get in trouble for it, but I think... But then I think about, um, I think what blew, knocked my socks off about Lebanon was literally there were Christmas tree lights on a mosque um, right next to a church. And I thought, this is, this is the way it should be. This is, mm -hmm. this is what we, uh, we dream about, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I remember, and I, then I think about Moorish flavors, right? The, uh, the, the Moors in uh, Spain and... Um, Southern Spain and using Sicily, exactly using uh, pork and um, for their kebabs, pork and cumin, um, and so I think it's okay. It does take a little rationalization, and and maybe it's not as common, but um, but yeah, I think I might. My original reaction was like yours. It's sort of like, ooh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about cultural appropriation which is another buzzword right now, which is, you know, adopting something from a culture that's not yours, which can be anything from uh, lately um, designers are using Amer Native American motifs on clothing, um, and, and of course food. There are some people who think that if you weren't raised on certain dishes that you shouldn't be making them. So what do you, what do you say to those critics? I think I'm going to hell or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Does that make me bad? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I would I mean, say. I mean, I've always thought that the people who are so adamant about cultural appropriation are are a little uh, jealous that they yeah, they didn't get there first. Yeah. Um, but it's it's often the people whose culture it is looking at somebody else who's doing it. Yeah, um, well, I, th I think it's interesting. It's reminding me to the, like the first day, maybe the first week or two that Oleana was open. Um, it opened in 2001. Bad timing for bringing Middle Eastern food into the mainstream. <laughs> um, I remember the first few Turkish customers that came into the restaurant and um, I was super nervous, more nervous than I am sitting up here in front of all of you guys tonight. I was so nervous. I was pacing back and forth, and and I thought, oh, they're gonna they're gonna say the same thing. They're like, what is this Norwegian girl from Seattle doing with our food uh, in Cambridge? Like, what is this, right? Um, but I think what I found the more and more and more and more was that they were almost brought to tears that someone paid attention. Um, to their food and, and wanted to, to study it and bring it into, um, into the forefront. And in a, in a way that it wasn't necessarily being done, it's not like there wasn't any Middle Eastern food in, in Boston 18, 19 years ago. It was just, it was, there wasn't very much Turkish food and it was, um, it was different. So um, yeah, I think um, it, it does make sense. It doesn't really make sense if you think about it. Why is a, a woman from Seattle um, with a Norwegian background, cooking Turkish food in Boston. I mean, it's not, it's a long story, right? It's not, um, it's not my great grandmother or my grandparents were Turkish and I, I grew up in the kitchen um, cook, making dolma with them all the time. But, um, but I think when you, I think what I try to do is really respect the rules and learn as much as I can. I mean, since that first trip to Turkey, I've gone once or twice a year for the last uh, 18, 19, 20 years, whatever it's been. Um, and it's really become, it's very serious commitment and study for me. And it's really, truly a, a passion for me. I, I still am finding um, small, um, and like I'll just go for, you know, to learn how they, you know, they, they make these things called pida, these long slipper shaped, which are coming sort of into the spotlight now because they're the in the Georgian, Watertown markets, yes. And also the, there's a lot of Georgian cookbooks that are coming out with these they're an Instagrammable thing too. I think they're just really beautiful. But they come from the Black Sea area in Turkey and there's a place, uh, a couple places in Istanbul that perfection. So, you know, I would go maybe three times and just watch them make it and sit and try it. And then I would watch these people eat them and they're like this big. 
They're shaped like a boat and they're stuffed with cheese and meat. They're not light, um, but they're, but then they have this one, you know those uh, pats of butter that you get like on the airplane that are wrapped, or they have the paper, the parchment paper top on it, just a little pat. I would watch them, this is what I was really fascinated with, take that one little pat of butter and evenly gloss up the entire pita with just that little bit of butter before they, they ate it. And that, to me, is like one of the incredible um, tips to what makes this food. Uh, you know, remember I said I tasted 30 different things on that one day for lunch. It's rich, but it's not heavy. And if you put more than a, I mean, temptation would be to just slather this pita with butter, right? Um, but it's not about that. It's just about enough butter to give it a little bit of shine um, and to add a teeny tiny hint of flavor to something that was already pretty rich. And what I really love that I saw in Istanbul were very smartly dressed women in high heels, pencil thin skirts, digging into one of these things at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Something like this, yes. yeah. Not absolutely. happening here very often. <laughs> Uh, Audi, Auto, uh, Yotam Ottolenghi, who's a celebrated Jerusalem-born restaurateur and author who lives in London, uh, he, I, I saw this on Instagram. He just sold one million copies of his most recent book, Ottolenghi, in one year. That is an astonishing number. That's ridiculous. What, how, did that, how did that happen? Yeah, he's, he's good. That's all I can say. He's He's good. It's the best of all of his books, I think. Yeah. Because it's the most approachable, and yeah. it doesn't take two days to make everything. Right, yeah. Um, so you have the best farm-to-table setup imaginable in your, um, in your, in your house and in your life. You're married to Chris Kurth, who owns Sienna Farms and delivers your produce to you. Um, <laughs> Uh, Sofra also... Not personally. <laughs> uh, Sofra also acts as the pickup spot for his CSA. It's a pretty sweet situation. Um, what about work balance, uh, work-life balance? Um, thank you. <laughs> you, uh, you and Chris have a teenage daughter. You own three restaurants. He, he farms 50 acres. He has two produce markets. He's a fixture at the Copley Square Farmer's Markets. Who makes your dinner? <laughs> he's an unbelievable cook. There's no, oh, and how the nice. Most, he's my biggest critic, too. He's got the most. <laughs> um, he's, got a, he's a really, really good cook. Um, I would, he, if, yeah, if he made it. Right now, he doesn't do anything. He just um, gets on the tractor and gets off the tractor, basically. And he's working um, a lot. So yeah, I mean, this is, this is harvest time. and. Um, um, you know, it's probably the most beautiful time of the year because the summer is dying and the fall is um, birthing, basically. So you see the death of tomatoes and eggplant right next to the birth of squash and uh, Brussels sprouts and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think we, uh, I'm teaching Sienna how to make our dinner, actually. <laughs> oh, well, that's a very good solution. So we'll see what happens with yes. that. She knows how to make Te great guacamole. Maybe you should tell her it's either that or a dishwashing job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, um, it's definition time to define a bunch of things. Um, the first one is fideos, F-I-D-E-O-S. Uh, fideos is uh, crushed vermicelli that's toasted. Um, and then cooked as though it's rice. So it absorbs liquid instead of being boiled like pasta. It absorbs the liquid that it's cooked in. Is it browned first? It typically? is toasted. Um, pomegranate molasses? Um, yeah, like which a. You've mentioned? Yeah, uh, just a reduction of pomegranate juice with sometimes a little salt. Um, it's really nice for acidity instead of lemon juice. Um, it's used um, in, in a lot of different things from salads to. Uh, you know how in, in France, when you finish a beef stew, um, for all those that have read Julia Child's cookbooks, you always, what they call mount a, a sauce or mount a stew with butter. So, in, and not just that little pat of butter, like a lot of butter. And then it becomes really shiny, which is so delicious. But in the, in the Middle East, or particularly in Turkey, they, they don't like heavy on heavy. So unless it's very small, 
So they'll use pomegranate molasses to like finish something really rich, like a beef stew or the braised short rib that we uh, have done for a long time is finished with tamarind, which does the same thing that pomegranate molasses does. Uh, kofta? Uh, kofta means... Uh, kofta. Um, uh, Correct my pronunciation as we go along. <laughs> Actually, my pronunciation is not so, <laughs> not so good on things. Uh, it, kofta or kibe is the Arabic word. Is a if it's made with vegetables, it's a uh, dumpling, a vegetable dumpling that's thickened or bound with fine bulgur wheat. If it's made with meat, it's like a meatball, but it's also bound with um, fine bulgur wheat. So instead of using like in Italy, you would you would bind a meatball with um, breadcrumbs, eggs, uh, flour, something like that. And in Turkey, you would use uh, or the Middle East, you would use uh, fine bulgur wheat. Uh, Lamajun. Lamajun, a flatbread. Um, and again, marinated, right? So instead of uh, you go all the way to the edge, never leaving plain edge, you go all the way to the edge with either ground meat or a vegetable paste so that as it's baked, the meat juices or the vegetable juices bake into the bread. Uh, Aleppo and Urfa pepper. Um, Aleppo is um, a sweet, oily, we're gonna, I'm gonna uh, use it in um, something tonight. It's a sweet, oily red chili. Um, it's actually not been coming from Aleppo lately, but it's yeah. from Aleppo, Syria. It's Syria. They grow the same or similar pepper in Marash, Turkey, but it's a bright red, oily chili. Known for its um, sweetness, not a lot of heat, little bit of heat. Um, if you have those dried red chili flakes in your cabinet, if you get rid of those and then use Aleppo or Marash in place of those, it's a game changer for You'll everything. Be much happier. I it agree. Is, they're so delicious. I have it next to my salt <laughs> in a little dish. Yeah, we season with um, salt and Marash and rarely use black pepper. So, and then Urfa is a dark chocolatey um, chili that's um, kind of got a bitter, sweet, and also an umami flavor from fermenting. I know I'm mispronouncing this. Muhammara. Mahamara, we're going to make a quick batch tonight. It's a oh, good. walnut and red pepper puree. Okay, and harissa. Harissa is a North African red chili condiment. Whew. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, one more quick one They've more. They've got to answer those questions. Yeah. Okay, these are just yes and no. So um, we're playing a game I call buy or sell. Buy is yes and sell is no. So I love this, Cheryl. Buy is, <laughs> buy is I like it, and sell is get it out of okay. my way. Okay. Um, ready chop supermarket vegetables. Buy or sell? Sell. Okay. Uh, spinach wrap for sandwiches. Ugh, sell. Okay. I Googled spinach wrap, and one of the most common questions was, is there spinach in spinach wrap? <laughs> and the answer, just so you know, is uh, typically less than 2% spinach powder. Oh, yeah. Uh, canned chickpeas. Buy. Canned chicken stock. Buy in a pinch. Canned soups. Uh, sell. Hummus with flavors like sun-dried tomatoes. Sell. Rotisserie chicken. Um... Depends what kind of chicken, but okay. maybe 50-50 on that. Meal, meal kits? Um, not a bad idea. Uh, buy. McCormick spices? Buy. Costco extra virgin olive oil? Uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's, it, it consistently wins uh, tasting awards. Does it really? Yeah. So, but nobody knows whose brand it is. Uh, Farm-raised salmon? Uh, sorry, guys. Sell. So. Okay. Uh, ask a Seattle girl about farmers. I know. Saying, okay. It's the Seattle uh, in me. Tilapia. Sell. So. Marinated kebab meat that you see in the supermarket. Sell. So. Uh, food in Target. <laughs> um. I don't know. Maybe a yogurt or something like that. Okay. <laughs> Popeye's chicken sandwich. Never. Is, it, is Popeye's chicken sandwich good? I don't know. I've never had one. Yes. I mean, I don't know. No, no. Don't take my word for it. I haven't had one. The world says it's good. The world says yes. Okay. Uh, now we're going to take a couple of questions, and then you're going to do a demo. So um, let me open this. And... Uh, 
let's see, is there a question here? Uh, yes. Um, where do you get high quality ingredients in the U.S. to replicate Turkish flavors? Um, I've got them over here if you need them. Okay. Uh, vegetables, um, Sienna Farms right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, before Thanksgiving, they have plenty of stuff. Um, and I love, my favorite place to shop is Sevon Bakery um, in Mount Auburn, um, on Mount Auburn Street. It's, um, if you've never been there, um, go, it's, it's incredible. Shopping. A lovely place, a mother and her two sons. Um, what kinds of flavors are you most interested or excited about cooking or eating right now? Um, right now, tomatoes, because they're gonna be gone very soon. Um, I'm so into vegetables right this minute because um, they're uh, habanada peppers. They're, they're habaneros without the heat. Um, it's a seed company from uh, Dan Barber, Blue Hill at Stone Barns. And so it's a ha habanero mixed with a jalapeno? No, ha it's ha just a habanada, or habanero ha with the heat taken out of it. Uh -huh. So it's one of those things where you taste it and you immediately go, uh-oh, this is gonna be a problem. But then nothing happens. And then, and then you realize that you really do know what uh, the habanada flavor is, and it's spectacular. It tastes like melons. It's unbelievable. Um, and some of these, uh, you know, cabbages, cabbages are really underrated, but when you get them from a farm, especially Sienna Farms, you, and I'm only plugging it because our soil is so good. The stuff is so good this year. But the, you cut open the cabbage and there's like juice in it. And you can just take a leaf and instead of a loaf of bread, you drag it through some hummus or you drag it through the mahamara. But cabbage is so underrated and it is so ridiculously sweet right now. Um, vegetables are on my mind. Okay, um, how do you hire and maintain such an amazing group of employees? Oh. Um, With difficulty. Yeah, it's tough times in the city right now. Mm -hmm. I think we're all really looking for, um, uh, we're always a half a person short. Um, but I think um, we try, I think culture is a, a, big, uh, a big conversation and a big piece of what we're trying to do. We really want uh, to create environments that are conducive to learning. Um, we don't have 401ks for everybody or there's no tricks like that, but we do try to uh, really teach and, um, and it's not that Anthony Bourdain or the, um, the old school sort of reputation where people are screaming and, and pans are being, you know, flying through the air and it's just this big stress box. It is very stressful, but we really try to um, take as much stress and make it as, um, Enjoyable, and if you watch people, they're having a pretty good time. Mm -hmm. So, um, and lastly, what's the most delicious bite of food you've eaten this year? Oh, um, a tomato. That's tough. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I feel like every day sometimes there's just like, have you guys had a peach this year? It's a good peach year. Mm. Um. I had a nectarine and a peach that was probably one of the most delicious things I've had in my life this year. Really good year for a fresh peach um, and a seasonal peach. And they're still around. The nectarines are really fabulous and we're going into plum time. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's a lot of really interesting restaurants in, um, in Boston and there's a lot of really beautiful, delicious bites. That pizza was really good, by the way. <laughs> Thank you um, so much. <laughs> Anna, what are we making over here? I'm going to do, um, should I go ahead mm -hmm. and start that? Oh, before, can I just give you a present? Yes, please. <laughs> so these are fresh fennel oh. seeds before they've dried. Oh, thank you. And I don't know if it's like super intoxicating up here. It kind of smells like we're going to have ouzo or rocky or yes, something. Yes, that's but. right. <laughs> oh, thank you. But they just dry. You can just leave them out like uh, on a sheet tray and they'll just dry naturally in the environment. Um, so I'm going to start. I'm going to make mahamara. Mahamara is the red pepper and uh, walnut puree. And uh, I love the walnuts at Sevon Bakery, by the way. They're, they're nice and blonde. They don't have the dark, really dark skins. Um, and we use a little bit of salt in with the food processor and just start grinding the, the walnuts first. 
And then we add some roasted pepper. And I don't have time to really uh, do this for you guys, but I wanted to show you, have, uh, for those that have never roasted a pepper, you literally just put it on um, a burner until the skin burns. And then they always say put it in a bag or like cover it with plastic. You don't even need to do that. Just let it sit and the skin just wipes right off and you can, you can see then you just get the, the pepper and that's a roasted pepper. And I think the most tempting thing is that people wanna wash it, um, but if you wash it, you're just gonna wash all the oil and stuff off of it. So just pull it off. Uh, dip your hand in a little water if it's like the black char is sticking to you, but try not to uh, wash it. You can also scrape it. And so then if, if you're telling, excuse me for interrupting, yeah. if you're telling people to, uh, to, to do it over their burner, their yeah. gas burner, you have someone cleaning your gas burners. Oh. It is. Is it bad? Really messy. Oh, because the, <laughs> sometimes the yeah. pepper pops? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I just I should check my burners. I haven't, okay. I haven't I just did some peppers the other day. So or or you can buy the piquillo peppers in the can. And the only reason why I say this is that in Spain they have really strict uh, regulations. So your canned peppers on piquillo are the real deal, and they're really beautiful peppers. So if you can find those, those are good substitutes. Um, but ideally, if you roast them, you can also put them in a hot oven, and the skin will blister. Uh, but you're cooking the peppers. It's a little bit different. So it's about equal parts, uh, walnuts to red peppers. Sometimes there's more walnuts to peppers, but you get this nice red color. Um, and again, it's, all, it's really all about the ingredients, right? So you really wanna have good um, peppers. You wanna have good walnuts. You have good chilies, which is the marash pepper that we were talking about earlier or the we should, Aleppo? We should show, um, the, is that coming across on the screen behind us? Um, and if very, you, can, you can see on my hands how, how it's kind of oily and sticky and shiny, and that's, that's good, it's sweet, and it's a little bit spicy. And this is scallions, um, this is cumin, And um, this is pomegranate molasses that um, Cheryl quizzed me on. <laughs> um, this is like, you know, the aged balsamic vinegar of the Middle East, sort of. Um, and it's really good. If you get this commercial stuff, it kind of tastes like cough syrup, unfortunately. But if you go and get the real deal, there's a brand called Maimune, which we have at Sofra, which is pure um, pomegranate, just pomegranate. It's uh, so delicious. And then we're gonna just add a little bit of olive oil. And you can make this uh, thicker or thinner, depending on um, what you prefer. But this is, as this sits, it becomes a little bit um, thicker and absorbs. You can also add breadcrumbs. In a traditional Mahamara uh, recipe, there are breadcrumbs. Um, and then we're serving this tonight with a little bit of extra um, pomegranate molasses. So this is, it's basically like uh, a hummus, but there's no bean in it. And we just, we always make like a little well in the center so that you can then add a little bit more uh, molasses, which you guys will have out there. I'm gonna get the last drop in there. And then we serve it with um, uh, simit, which is uh, made with a really beautiful flour from One Mighty Mill, finally our own um, Stone in, in mill and Lynn. Lynn, yeah. So this this must be homemade because when you That's get our them in, cement. Yeah. when you get them in Turkey, they're not pudgy like that. They're very yeah. thin and no, those are def those are yeah. the sofra cement with one mighty mill flour, which is pretty extraordinary stuff. It's um, you'll be able to taste it, but it's it's stone ground wheat, which is they got a, an old stone mill there, so it's pretty fabulous. And the other thing you can do too, I just wanted to talk briefly. You can use it uh, for your little eggplants. And I just use my fingers, but you can use like the back of a spoon after you roast it, you poke holes in it. And then your eggplant's ready to be bathed, whether you brush um, mahamara on it, um, or, and you just eat it like this with the pomegranate molasses and maybe some chopped scallions. Mm, or you spoon fantastic. like salsa on it, mm -hmm. and then you bake it. Corn, salsa, whatever. Like we do a chopped uh, spoon salad with cucumbers and, or sorry, not in this one in the eggplant. We do um, peppers, corn, um, summer squash, little onion, 
and lots of fresh grated tomato, and then we just soak the eggplant in that and then bake it. And it's um, it's a very traditional Turkish di dish called imam bayaldo, which means it was so good that the imam fainted. Um, <laughs> so uh, you asked Chris to leave the stems on all your baby eggplants? I know, right? It's yeah. cute, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Very. So the other thing, too, myth about eggplant, right? Everybody just lops off the top. The best part of the eggplant, I don't know, can you see this close up? Yes. You see this neck of the eggplant has no seeds. It is so sweet and creamy, so don't lop it off. Um, pull the hat um, up and off um, so that you don't just cut it because this part is the best part. And then we striped the eggplant. You can see we took a peeler and we peeled some of it, and that way the eggplant stays together but some of the skin, it's not, um, it becomes a little more creamy in texture. So that's Mahamra. And then the next thing I wanted to show you was a really simple, quick um, yogurt dish because yogurt is such a staple in, in the Middle East. Um, and it's, it's a tzatziki. Uh, that's the Greek word. Uh, the Turks call it jajik, which is spelled C-A-C-I-K. Um, and I'm gonna do one with beets. And I'm gonna do a little garlic chopping. Uh, you can use a microplane on, on raw garlic. Um, that gets it really fine. And this is just a little trick that we use. This is, takes a little practice, but you use the back of the knife. You pull the garlic that has been split in half towards the edge of your cutting board. Because if it's in the center, you won't have the leverage because the knife is upside down. And then you can really quickly chop it with the back of the knife, and then chop it again this way. With the front of the knife. With the front of the knife, and then you have really finely um, minced garlic. And when you have, um, there's already a little bit of garlic in there, I think. That's it. Um, when you have raw garlic, uh, you put it in a little bit of lemon juice, and it kind of takes the heat out of it. And it should be finely minced, so, um, if you have a microplane, that's the best thing. The garlic press is a little bit sort of like slams it, juices it, smashes it kind of thing. Um, this just sits with a little bit of salt um, for maybe five, six minutes to take some of the heat off. And then I roasted a beet. So this beet, um, when, when it's hot, it's not gonna do it now because it's cool, but when it's hot, the skin rubs off with uh, just a towel. Um, so they've been roasted with olive oil and a tiny bit of water, covered with foil, hot oven, about an hour. You're not doing your own laundry either. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Touche, that was good. Uh, so lemon juice. <laughs> so labne. So uh, yogurt, when we opened Oleana, it was such a bad word, right? It was low fat, non fat, full of sugar, fruit on the bottom chalky texture, a punishment because it was like you were you know, on a diet, you had to eat yogurt that was really chalky and super sweet. Um, this is yogurt right here. This is, so yogurt is you know, all about being unctuous and creamy, but what it really has is acidity, and acidity is really great in cooking. It's like adding this little splash of lemon juice or something. It's really essential to, to flavor. Um, this is labne. Labne has been strained, so it's like Greek yogurt that's been strained, essentially. Um, this actually looks like it, it could be Greek yogurt. There are some that are really thick. Um, and then we're just going to add a little bit of the lemon juice. Are you making that or buying it? We're buying this, labne. Um, sometimes we do, we do we're going to start doing some yogurts, but we have different sources. Narragansett yogurt, uh, love it. That We're a big fan of that one. It's not as not easy to beer. find. Not the beer company. The, oh, right, the creamery. It, yes, the yes. Creamery. That's right, they have beer, too. So salt, lemon juice, and garlic, and then you have and a little bit of olive oil. Now, if you do have the non-fat, low-fat yogurt, you can add a little more olive oil, and you'll get the mouth feel um, back in, uh, with the different kind of fat. And then this is really our base. And then at this point, we fold it into uh, vegetables. And I brought a couple different versions of this. If you could do the grated beet, um, where you just basically, it's equal parts. You can see the, the ratio, the yogurt sauce and the beets. Um, or you can do the jajik, which is like tzatziki, which is anything and everything green. So 
cucumber, um, chopped Swiss chard, and spinach. And we've just squeezed it dry so there's no, so it doesn't make the sauce um, watery. And then um, the sort of holy trilogy of fresh green herbs, which is parsley, mint, dill. And those three herbs together is what makes something taste um, Turkish, uh, absolute classic uh, combination. So, and when you're doing herbs, you wanna just take these herbs in your hand, roll them up and slice them versus um, chop them super fine because they do bruise. Um, but basically all the green things just have enough yogurt, garlicky yogurt in them to hold together. So this is like, uh, kids love this stuff. They slather it on um, the cement or whatever. They're just, it's a big bowl of greens dressed with thick garlicky yogurt. So when you add the beets to that, do you, does it turn um, It pink? turns bright pink, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the same idea, so I don't, I don't have quite enough yogurt, but the same idea, same ratio is I would add about equal parts. Mm -hmm. And then. Is this something you made up or? Yeah, this is something we made up now. Um, it's become kind of a, a staple for all. I mean, I think anyone who's been to Sofer knows this and then. We also have it on our falafel at Oleana, and um, it's been here and there at Sarma as well. It's kind of a mother recipe. And then chopped dill as well. And maybe a little bit. I'm going to thin it out just a hair. This also makes the, the beet bleed a little bit more. It looks but, like my father's borscht. <laughs> does, doesn't you know, it? When you, when you add sour cream to um, borscht. Yeah, and then this this is really uh, yeah, it's like what's the mimo it's like mimosa almost too, isn't there a southern salad with like oranges, beets, and cream or something? What am I thinking of? Something very creamy and pink, but again, also a real real crowd pleaser for uh, kids. Um, really easy to get uh, lots of vegetables um, in this, but you see that basically it's the same ratio. So whenever you do. Um, the yogurt, think of it as more or equal parts vegetables to yogurt, not, ve not yogurt with a little bit of vegetables in it, really pack the veggies in it. So, so is, is everybody getting a sample of this outside? Yeah, so you all will try uh, one of our crackers from Sofra with a little um, beet tzatziki and then the cement with the mahamra um, outside, out, um, I think Jenna and okay, lucky you. And Macy are plating them up. Thank, Thank you, you very this much. This was really great. Yeah, I appreciate Thank it. You Thank much. you very much. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really lovely. I know you'll love that panel too. It's so beautiful. We're funded by you, our listeners, and by...